Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to this Leading the Charge uh, conference, the last session. And uh, this session is going to deal with the future of energy storage, including the, the hydrogen as well. Uh, again, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Handan Tezel. I am a professor uh, at University of Ottawa in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. And uh, I'm also the team leader uh, for the NSERC uh, Energy Storage uh, Technology Network, uh, responsible for Team 1. And uh, so I actually took part in, the, in all the sessions uh, earlier today. It, uh, it turned out to be a very interesting, um, a very interesting day uh, indeed. Uh, so the agenda for this session is going to be, I'm just going to first uh, in briefly, very briefly introduce the, the panelists. And then uh, each of them, uh, four panelists, and each of them are going to have their five minute introductory comments uh, from the panelists. And then that's going to be uh, followed by the moderated discussion. Uh, and, uh, and afterwards, uh, we're going to open the floor for, uh, uh, for the questions, uh, questions uh, from, from everybody. So um, as uh, happened in the previous sessions, please uh, uh, write your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your uh, screen so that uh, I can post these questions to the, to the panels. So uh, we are going to, so I'm going to, uh, before I introduce the, the speakers, uh, the panelists actually, uh, I don't think I have to convince uh, people who are taking part in this event uh, on the importance of energy storage. So we all realize that that's why, uh, you know, we're uh, taking part in doing research in this area and hopefully contributing a little bit um, uh, in, into the development of this technology. So, so without further ado, we have the, the panelists, uh, not in specific order, but uh, we have our first panelist uh, from uh, University of Birmingham, uh, Yulang Deng. Maybe you can just say hi. As I say I hi. <laughs> uh, so he's the, he's the director of Birmingham Center for Energy Storage at University of Birmingham. Our second panelist is uh, Andrew Rowe. He's from, he's coming to the panel uh, from University of Victoria. He's the executive director of Institute for Integrated uh, Energy Systems. Uh, hi, uh, Andrew. And our third panelist is uh, Lucas Swan from, uh, he's a professor at uh, Dalhousie University. Hi, hi, Lucas. And our last panelist, uh, last but not least, we have uh, Ian Rowland from University of Waterloo. He's a professor uh, at that university. So um, I'm going to uh, let uh, Yulang Ding uh, first uh, uh, do your uh, five minute speech, please, introductory remarks, and, and then we'll take it from there. The floor is yours, Yulang. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Yunong Ding. I'm uh, leading Birmingham Center for Energy Storage. And also, there is a program in the UK called uh, Silver Chain Energy Storage, and I'm leading that program at the moment. Uh, I'm a professor of chemical engineering and actually the founding chairman professor of the university um, and uh, who is the founder of uh, Birmingham University uh, well over 100 years ago. And uh, um, my area of research has been on um, uh, thermal and liquid area energy storage, if we're more specific on storage area. So I invented liquid area energy storage some 15, 16 years ago, which is, has already been commercialized by a company called Highview Power. The company is building uh, two large scale systems. It's a 50 megawatts, uh, about 250 megawatts hours system. And the overall uh, investment of the, of the, tech, uh, of the uh, two sets of uh, uh, systems will be well above 200 million so US dollars. And I also developed uh, composite phase change materials, which has also been commercialized and with a total installation of around 300 megawatts and 1.25 gigawatts hours of last four years. 
And my current research actually mainly focusing on, on the thermal chemical storage. I think, I think that, that that's the future of the next probably about five to 10 years. And the reason for my research on thermal energy area, um, actually liquid areas energy storage is, is, is a thermal energy storage uh, category. So the, uh, is, is that the global end use of energy over 50% of that is in thermal form is based for thermal comfort. And, but the renewable uh, energy sort of a uh, portion of that thermal energy is, is less than 10%. And I think the, 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 it's important for all of us to, to, uh, uh, to, to take that seriously. And uh, because it's more important for ourselves, for the society, for decarbonizing the energy system in the future. Uh, it's it's uh, not less important than um, in actual chemical storage methods. It's just the, the uh, it's uh, older technology, uh, older science, and but it's, it's, it's not been taken uh, seriously enough. So that's me, thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yulong. So we'll, we'll follow those uh, technologies up uh, in our further discussion. So next, uh, Andrew, uh, please, uh, for your introductory remarks. Thanks, Hendon. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm Andrew Rowe at the University of Victoria. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. And I have the pleasure right now of being the director for a research center uh, called ICEVIC, which is the Institute for Integrated Energy Systems. And ICEVIC has been going for about 25 to 30 years, depending on how you start your, your, your origin story, I guess, for our, our center. And uh, it's really interesting. It's actually a, a real pleasure to be here at this time. Uh, I've noticed this week, the Globe and Mail seems to have recurring articles all about uh, energy storage and hydrogen in particular. And this is um, this is really where IceFix started. We had an initial program, a large research project, which was really about the hydrogen economy quite generally. And, you know, that's 30 years ago. And the drivers at the time were essentially the drivers that are being discussed today. It's this flexibility, um, these challenging sectors that we're trying to decarbonize and the, the fungible nature of hydrogen, just like electricity. Um, and so the Institute, you know, has a, a long track record of looking at technology specifically, but I think the area where we've had the most uh, impact and, and where we, we get the most uh, traction is really around the systemic analysis component. And so I think, you know, the panel discussion and the, and the topic of, uh, you know, transactive energy in general, the integration of the, the gas and the electricity sector, um, it's a great you know, it's just a really important area that we're seeing um, a lot of talk right now. And I think partially, and we'll, I guess we'll talk about this, but my sense right now is part of the reason that hydrogen has seemed to come back as a, as a technology option is we're starting to, um, I think more and more of us are starting to do hindcasting instead of forecasting, where we all are thinking about a decarbonized future. And 10 years ago, we were doing sort of let's project forward and see where we can get to. I think now there's very serious agreement on you know, net zero at dates that aren't that far out. And when you start to go to that point in time in your mind and start to think about what's really required, you start to think about the backwards perspective. And um, once the easy things are done, which hopefully you know, electrification is gonna take care of a good chunk of it, we still have some really challenging areas that um, might not be direct electrification. So we sometimes talk about indirect and that's one of the value propositions from a hydrogen vector is the indirect opportunities. So um, I'm hoping to, uh, to have a great discussion here. I love this integration aspect around uh, storage, electricity and chemical currencies, thermal aspects as well. Um, and I think I'll leave it there for now. Great, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Next, uh, Lucas, uh, please for your introductory remarks. Uh, thank you, Hendon. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And uh, my name is Lucas Swan. I'm the principal investigator of the new Renewable Energy Storage Laboratory at Dalhousie University. I basically run an applied battery research lab. So our work is principally in batteries. And uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that a lot of the experiments that we're running today will advise the control strategies of large format energy storage systems that are being built over the forthcoming, uh, forthcoming decade. We actually started brand new cell experiments this morning, stacking services 
on each other to look at the degradation patterns. And this experiment will last more than a year uh, long. That was a very long time, especially when you can easily screw things up in an experimental sense uh, going forward. But that really excites me and drives our program forward. But what I really wanted to talk to you today um, about was our work in modeling of energy storage systems. So half of my laboratory focuses on modeling. And because we're talking about transactive energy here, we're looking at uh, very interesting scenarios going forward in time and the use of a variety of different technologies to solve those problems, which span geospatial scales, uh, temporal scales, and integrate a variety of different uh, generation sources and different load profiles, just as uh, Dr. Rogers spoke to. Um, become very important. So I'd like to speak to you about one project in particular that we're working on. And this is a very forward looking study of very high penetration rates of renewable energies with our electricity grid and the interplay between uh, those intermittent generation sources and the conventional generating sources, which exist and will continue to exist for quite some time on the electricity grid whether powered by say a fossil fuel or powered by a hydrogen fuel or something else, our models tend to operate in an agnostic pattern, technology agnostic pattern, excuse me, in the sense of uh, using the energy storage to control the fluctuations and discern the necessary parameters of that energy storage to reach an end objective. And that end objective could be smoothing of renewables. Um, it could be realignment of those renewables to load it could be the integration of those renewables to allow a system operator to go to higher penetration rates without affecting present conventional generation limitations and things like that. There's two very significant uh, pieces of work that went into this model, which we just published two articles on recently and uh, be happy to share them with you if you're interested, that make the work unique. Uh, the first is that it's all data driven. All too often in the last 20 years, I've found that uh, modelers have used synthetic data. And while that's okay for doing annual energy assessments or monthly energy assessments, it doesn't capture the dynamic behavior of the different generating sources and different uses. And those interplays, those temporal and spatial interplay and dynamics between generation sources and loads is what's crucial in designing energy storage systems to fit them. So that's, that's one unique facet. The second unique facet is that we're uh, bringing together three different electricity generating sources from renewables. Solar and wind are very conventional ones that you'll see a lot of people working and we added title to that. And as you might imagine with three things, it gets hard to present on a two axis chart. So what we've done is we've created triangles and you might imagine a, a, a triangle of results where all one way is all wind generation, all another way is solar generation and all the other way is tidal generation. But by placing yourself within the triangle, you can get any mix you wish. And we've evaluated all of those mixes and looked at the amount of curtailment that occurs, the size of the energy storage that is needed to uh, smooth or control ramp rates and things like that. Uh, we looked at the amount of curtailment, which is lost electricity or energy that could have been converted should we had additional storage. And then we evaluate the capital cost of those uh, technologies inclusive of energy storage that goes on. And to close out, I want to give you two uh, interesting results that came out of this study, because I think they're very pertinent to electricity grid planners, uh, project developers, uh, utilities, um, and of course, even uh, governing bodies and regulators. And the first is that to provide one to two hours of storage for mitigation of ramps or variations in intermittent generation added to the cost the capital cost of projects by about 15 to 20%, which I don't think is an inordinate amount to achieve the objectives that are set out uh, with respect to what uh, Dr. Rowe was just bringing up in the, in the short and long-term uh, carbon neutral projections and, and so on. The second very interesting thing is that we have enough data now that was taken over multiple years to look at true seasonal storage. And when you say seasonal storage, every technology is back on the table, except flywheels, I think. Um, and we looked at that and the numbers were rather shocking in size of megawatt hours to go to essentially pure renewable intermittent generation. Um, but they came out and just to give you a number, it was about 20 megawatt hours of energy storage is necessary for each megawatt 
of intermittent generation that gets added to the grid to go to super high penetration rates. Think completely intermittently powered. Do I think we'll go to completely intermittent power? No, I think that we'll use all kinds of different sources. Uh, it could be nuclear, it could be lots and lots of hydro going forward and so on. But if we did go to completely intermittent, it'd be about 20 megawatt hours per megawatt installed. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close up and say that we're really looking at uh, these long-term projections of how to drastically alter our electricity generation and use sector, uh, the addition of energy storage towards that. And I look forward to the discussion of the impacts that that will be having along with some of my colleagues who are here are on the call. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, so next, uh, Ian, please go ahead with your introductory remarks. Thanks very much, Hendon. And um, thank you very much to the conference organizers for the opportunity to be on this panel. Delighted to be here. And I I'd like to divide my introductory comments into three parts. And first, I'll talk a little bit about the insights we've gained from the five, works we, five years of work we did on NestNet. Second, I'll, I'll offer some reflections on what I think many of us have learned in wake of the global pandemic we're all living through. And then third, some priorities for the future as uh, we work to advance energy sustainability. So let me start with a bit about our research uh, over the past five years on the NestNet. So it was, it was my pleasure to be part of the, the NestNet team. And I was in charge of a project that looked at the social acceptance of energy storage technologies and was delighted to be working with some outstanding uh, student researchers to investigate this. And I direct any of the attendees on the conference to the project webpage if they want to dig in a bit, bit deeper on that. But here I'd, I'd just like to share three major lessons that came out of our work. A uh, first lesson was we, we found energy issues are multi-sector and multi-stakeholder and different people bring different understandings, different experiences, different priorities and different lenses to issues and projects. So I think all of us going forward should recognize this and recognize that when people see the same things, they'll see them differently perhaps, and we should all plan accordingly. A second thing I'd like to flag is that um, we learned that effective engagement between, for example, uh, proponents of projects and local residents is, is critical when developing new energy projects. Engagement must be early, sustained, and meaningful. And there must be multiple opportunities for information provision and two-way exchange. And commitments must be fulfilled promptly and transparently. And then third, we learned that communication must be fulsome, truthful, and accessible. All involved must be committed to open dialogue and to working to agree statements as quickly as possible. And should, should misunderstandings or miscommunications ever arise, they should be worked at jointly to, to rectify, to remedy as quickly as possible. So our work, and there's been a lot of work interestingly over the past five years in this area, um, a lot of that work has shown the importance of social acceptance to ensure that the, the right energy initiatives are taken forward and that they're taken forward in a, a timely, cost-effective and sustainable manner. So recognizing differences among stakeholders and their perspectives, implementing effective engagement strategies and communicating clearly will go a long way towards ensuring energy activity success. Let me move on to a, to a second part of what I wanted to say and a couple of reflections, a few reflections on the, what the global pandemic has taught us all and probably irrespective of the sector in which we're working. First, evidence-based decision-making is more important now than perhaps ever. We must have rigorous and independent investigations to place a premium upon standards like validity and reliability. And second, and I think we've heard it a number of times today already, collaboration is vital. We need multiple perspectives across disciplines, jurisdictions, ecosystems, cultures, and so on. And we need bright minds with different experiences, knowledge bases, resources, ways of thinking. We need them all to come together to address the, the challenges and the opportunities that we're facing. And third, we have to ensure that we leave no one behind. We need to ensure that those who are most vulnerable, this is in terms of individuals, households, communities, entire countries even, We've got to ensure that they're fully included as we move towards solutions and sustainable livelihoods. We must eliminate racism and discrimination of all kinds. 
So that leads me to what I take to be some critical insights for energy sustainability. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you and fellow panelists just three that I'm keeping in mind as I look to the future and think about my work in energy issues going forward. First, whatever I'm doing, I'm now asking myself much more explicitly, what's the goal of my work? What do I really want? And I think it may speak to Andrew's comments on uh, hindcasting in some ways as well. There is no longer a, an excuse if there ever was one uh, to simply say that, well, it's, it's inertia. We've always been doing it this way, so we're gonna do it this way in the future as well. So for my own work in energy, for energy projects, why are we doing this? Why am I doing this? Given that societies are working to build back better and to reset, I'm going to think explicitly about what my contribution to that will be. Second, I'd say I'm going to be anticipating connections. These are connections across space, time, discipline, sectors, and so on. And as a first cut, I'm going to use the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals that Global Society agreed in 2015 in order to get me thinking about it. So there is SDG 7, which is on ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. That's obviously an important one. But SDG 13 on climate change, both its mitigation and adaptation elements is, is pivotal in any energy issue. And it's pivotal for every issue we face in a global society today. But so too is SDG 10. And on reduced inequalities and the, and the list goes on across all the SDGs. So going forward, when I think of an energy activity, I'll, I'll recognize that its impact will be broad and I'll try to anticipate men, multiple consequences. And, and third, resilience is critical. We have to expect the unexpected. So we have to build our energy research programs, our energy projects, our policies, our regulations, our institutions to be as nimble, flexible, and, and adaptable as possible. Uh, I think the last seven or eight months have shown us that low probability and high risk events do indeed occur. And in my own work, I'll work to ensure that I've got options going forward. So Hendon, as we've got a panel looking at the future, um, helping me think about the future is the five years of work on, on NEST, not only the project I shared with you, but the project uh, uh, broadly across the many themes. I'll, I'll think about the global pandemic because it's setting us on a trajectory that's going to be consequential for, for at least the near future. And so purpose, connections, and resilience are three words that are going to guide my thinking about the future. Thanks very much, Andy. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you all uh, raised the very important issues, especially the ones that uh, you know, not leaving anybody behind, like we definitely have to do that. We have actually been living through that, through the, you know, all the racism, discrimination, uh, you know, you name it. So we're living through that. So we have to make sure that as educated people in the society, we have to make sure that we lead in these uh, issues so that, um, you know, everybody has equal access to uh, the healthcare, the energy. Uh, I mean, this issue actually has been brought up in the previous session as well as to equal opportunity for, for energy storage. But anyway, we'll, we'll come to that in our uh, discussions later on. So um, what we're going to do next is I'm going to have individual questions uh, to the individual panelists, but uh, uh, the other panelists, please, uh, uh, you know, feel free to join in uh, after, uh, during the discussion as well. So my first question goes to, to Yulang. Uh, so uh, Yulang, I, I read your paper on uh, three-in-one energy storage with uh, great interest. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little, a little bit? I think in all of our discussions, we haven't really talked about the, the thermal energy storage, most of the people who are online, they're all dealing with uh, mostly, I should say, in electrical uh, storage, but uh, I think you're the one, uh, me as well, I'm, I'm working on thermal energy storage as well. And uh, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on your three-in-one uh, energy storage uh, that you're developing? 
Okay, and no, I thank you very much. And uh, um, so the uh, three one really is based upon our work of last uh, quite a few years, probably about more than ten years. But the reason for that is, is uh, um, there are three technologies for thermal energy storage. One is a sensible heat storage, which means you you are looking at a temperature difference and uh, the material property in terms of heat capacity of material. So the higher the temperature, you you store more energy in uh, in the material. And the second technology is called a latent heat, which you use the phase change of materials for storing heat. And the third one is relaying on uh, the reversible sorption processes or reversible reaction processes. We call it a thermochemical. And actually, if you look at um, the, uh, uh, the second method, which is uh, we call latent heat or you, the use of phase changing materials, uh, you, you can't really only have phase change without sort of a temperature which is slightly lower than phase changing temperature because materials, uh, when you look at the phase change, we lo main look at sort of a liquid solids phase transition. From solids to liquids uh, uh, phase transition, you need to have a little bit higher temperature than phase change temperature in order for the, uh, uh, the, the, the overcome the energy barrier. I mean, for those, uh, you know, chemists or physicists or, or you know, even A-level uh, physicists, physicists, you would know that. And, and uh, so, because the temperature is different from the actual phase change temperature, you actually also store a little bit of sensible heat, which is due to the temperature difference. And, and hence, in all uh, phase change material based latent heat storage, you do have uh, you know, the, uh, both sensible and latent heat storage. So it's a hybrid. And for thermal chemical, the third method is the same. Um, but the reason we try to combine the uh, uh, phase change material, which is latent heat, and the sensible heat with the thermal chemical storage material is that uh, normally when you look at the thermal chemical storage uh, uh, technologies, the materials is the main challenge because you look at the, uh, something, you know, incorporating into another material, either in the surface or the interior of the material, or remove the material from from the interior on the surface, then you subject the material to vulner, uh, vulnerability because uh, the structure will be weakened, and uh, you have a, a cycle a, a cyclability issues. So lots of uh, or the majority of thermal chemical materials today is that they can't really go through many thermal cycles, and same to phase change materials. So this lead to the uh, development of something called composite materials or hybrid, and uh, which involves the use of phase changing material as backbone for some chemical materials or the other way around. And uh, this is a probably is, is still not very clear to you guys, but I think if, 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 you, if I take an example, probably th th that would be best way to for that, think about uh, you know the, the, there is a material called uh, uh, um, the sodium sulfate with a six waters in it. So so it's a it's a it's a it's a sort of salt, and uh, the the uh, uh, if you want to take so, uh, water out of the salt, then uh, you need to heat it up to about 150, maybe 130 degrees C, and uh, under dry conditions, you need to take water out. Once you take water out, because the water originally in the crystal structure of the uh, sodium sulfate, then this, this, the, the material becomes porous and uh, becomes sort of a, but if you um, um, try to add a water system to the material, you, you, you turn it back basically. So, so, you, so you, you get sort of a, a, a hydrogen source. So the tricky part of that is, uh, the material uh, sodium sulfate only works with a, a vapor phase of water, not a liquid phase of water. If you have a little bit of condensation, then uh, sodium sulfate will, will, will dissolve, forming liquid phase, which will, will sort of uh, block all the pores of the. So that's the main problems. So if we add a certain material, either the uh, sensible heat material, like uh, you know the uh, magnesium oxide particles, or graphite for enhanced heat transfer, or a phase change material like a high uh, density polyacetic glycol, and they are, they are pretty sort of a, uh, 
if the, the, you know the, the, therefore the strength structure and hence also increase the energy density uh, 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 by by way uh, by the way so so that's the, the 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 rationale for developing that materials and actually we were fairly successful in uh, making some of, of those formulations and we have not been able to sort of make large quantities so far so um, so there's lots of challenges ahead so so I'll stop here so if, if there are any questions I <laughs> have to answer. Those when you're when you're working with uh, hybrid materials, because you know, depending on the temperature around which you're working with, uh, you have to choose your material accordingly, right? So whether you're uh, close to atmospheric uh, temperatures, like around 20, 30 degrees, or some of the phase change materials actually work at uh, 300 degrees centigrade. So how do you optimize that? How do you combine those? Okay, so that's a very good question. And, and uh, so the way we do it is, uh, uh, so first of all, you need to uh, look at the application. What's the application scenarios? For example, space heating. We are looking at uh, sort of, uh, um, the, the, uh, if we use uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, central heating system, the input temperature of water, for example, would be about between 70 and 80 degrees C, typically about 75 degrees C. And returning water is about 35 to 45 degrees C. So, so if you want to store heat, there are two ways. One is a storing heat roughly, roughly around sort of a, um, you know, 80 or 85 degrees C, which is about 10 degrees higher than the actual uh, the the temperature needed for 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 the application. So, so the second way is is that uh, sort of you 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 for large scale district heating system, you have uh, another sort of heat store which stored heat at high temperatures depends on the source of heat, where's the heat coming from. So if it's from, you know, the solar thermal, then, you know, probably the highest you can get about 150 degrees C if you don't concentrate the, the solar. And if you use the solar thermal, normal thermal solar, probably in, in the winter months or even autumn months in, in Canada, for example, probably you rarely get something above, you know, 60 or 70 degrees C because just the, the environment temperature is too low for that. Um, so if you use a, you know, CSP type, you know, in winter, you can't really get very high temperature. So even in Europe, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the summer constant solar power stations they don't operate much in, in winter. So, so, so which requires the storing heat across seasons, which is another side of why we do the thermal chemical storage, because thermal chemical storage can store energy in large quantities in large scale for very long time because there are very little loss in you know, overheat through thermal chemical uh, methods. So uh, come back to the question, uh, the, uh, um, for phase change materials, again, it depends on A, the heat source, B is depends on the actual application temperature you, you, you want. Then from that, we choose materials. And when you choose materials, you need to consider A, the, the, the cost of the material, the availability of the material are they, you know, lithium, because lithium is, is really, you can't, you know, there's not, not much lithium in the earth. So, so and also the uh, health and safety aspects, uh, and also the locality, which is, is, is a far away from your site, or, you know, you have to look at the transportation cost as well. So, so um, with those in mind, then you need to do formulation, for example, for composite materials, you look at the sort of, are the components chemically compatible? Are they physically compatible? Then with those, you know, screening process, you need to do lots of experiments and then you come up with a, sort of a, a few options. Then come to the stage where you look at the fabrication and, uh, um, you know, conventional fabrication process, for example, you have a meaning, you know, you grind the particle down to a certain size, you mix them, you then you add a little bit of sort of a binder to form uh, uh, modules, and then you have to sort of uh, dry and or center in them um, uh, into, into certain forms. So, so, and then you have to actually look at the whole chain, you know, from, uh, you know, the raw material to processing to actual eventual sort of a, uh, installation, look at the whole chance of the cost for the whole sort of a, a system. And, uh, um, and uh, so, so uh, look at sort of a, as a game, what you, uh, 
you know, the, 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 the source of energy uh, costs. And then you do some economic analysis and find out, you know, how many years you recover the money. And uh, that, that's the way we do it. So actually the, the, uh, the successful implementation of uh, the composite phase change materials I mentioned in my short uh, introduction is based on this approach. So which is a was fairly successful. So hopefully that's give you an <laughs> answer. So. Yeah. Great, uh, thank you very much. So uh, my next question is going to be uh, for, for Andrew. So Andrew, you talked about the, the hydrogen uh, technology. So uh, I mean, hydrogen is great uh, to be used in, in buses in large cities. Uh, uh, you know, you know, when it burns, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, have uh, greenhouse gas emissions at all. But then this hydrogen has to come from somewhere, right? So there are different sources of uh, hydrogen uh, sources. So we can do it uh, from water electrolysis, which is a kind of like a more cleaner, uh, uh, cleaner technology, or we can uh, develop it from, uh, from, fossil fuel methane, uh, but also again, uh, is could methane could be fossil fuel or it could be renewable methane. So all these questions about the production of the hydrogen, um, can you uh, speak to that a little bit and, and where is the technology going for the future? Sure, yeah, that's, it's a, you know, that's I think one of the fundamental questions people have when we talk about hydrogen and its, and its role. And, um, you know, there's not a lot new. Uh, this sort of where, do, what are the options and where do, where do we get it from? Ha hasn't really changed since we started talking about this 40 years ago. Um, but of course, there's been some technology changes and I'll, I'll kind of get to that. So what, what's interesting is I've noticed there's been a bit of a rebrand. And so I, I think people are understanding there's nuances in terms of the GHG value of, of hydrogen, depending upon uh, the resource we use. So you see these terms gray, blue, and green hydrogen being thrown around. And, um, and I, again, this is obviously to help people understand that there's, there's going to be different value propositions from different sources. So gray represents the fossil fuel pathway, typically are the way we do it now, right, with the steam methane reforming. So methane is really the hydrogen supply. Um, so that would be our gray option. Of course, you have the CO2 that would, would come off of that. Um, and then our, our blue would be, well, let's get smart and let's capture the CO2 and, and sequester or put it away or at least remove it or displace some emissions so we can make it a, a cleaner uh, supply option. And then the, the green hydrogen is, is, you know, let's use clean electricity and electrolysis and water. And we've got a nice carbon neutral vector for uh, moving a lot of energy or storing a lot of energy. Um, so nothing's, nothing is really new there. I think the part that's interesting um, in, in my view is, is the convergence of um, sort of techno-economic forces around the electrolysis pathway. So the electrolysis pathway is very clearly a nice one when it comes to carbon. It also has some great um, sort of spatial flexibility options. You can make use of a region's local supply for clean electricity, whatever that might be. Um, but of course, the problem compared to the other two, the gray and blue, is that the cost issue. And that's where things have really changed, I think. It's, we see now, and if you project forward again, we're seeing more and more <laughs> negative pricing events occurring in wholesale electricity markets. We see the costs continue to go down with renewable generation options. And so this is a blessing and a curse. Of course, renewable generators need to pay for stuff still. So if, if negative, if, you know, get negative forcing on pricing, how do they recover enough money to pay for, you know, capital? And, and so there's a balancing act. There's a desire to maintain some higher level of a, a cost or a price. And so coupling, right, coupling electricity, clean electricity that may be from renewables to electrolysis and hydrogen production has a lot of value proposition to it in terms of sort of systemic benefits. So, but it's typically known to be a more expensive pathway. So we sort of are seeing the solution in terms of the operating costs. So electricity getting cheaper, that really will drive down the product cost, but you still have an electrolyzer to pay for. And what's, um, you know, if we talk about sort of barriers and attractors to this technology, um, 
we, we're seeing the attractor now because of the desire to decarbonize and this problem with managing flexibility in grids. Um, the barrier, of course, is this cost and, and why, why electrolyzers look interesting are the same reasons in my mind that, that solar, wind, um, battery technology are all interesting. And it's the, it's the combination of techno-economic characteristics. So uh, an electrolyzer, like a, a battery or a solar system, you can imagine it being built out in a low risk way. So low risk, meaning you can do small incremental additions. You don't have to commit to a very large installation, which means a lot of capital at risk. You can do small additions. Modularity means you can kind of do it in lots of different uh, places easily. And the biggest benefit or the biggest, um, let's say characteristic that comes from technologies like this are the ones we, we keep talking about now with solar, wind and, and storage. It's this learning effect where you see the cost of the technology and the performance changing really fast. And it's because learning meaning you, we typically do better when you do a lot of something. So if we do a lot of repeated operations, repeated manufacturing on modular type components, we tend to see some really significant cost reductions and performance improvements. So this is the solar and wind story and now the battery story. So electrolyzers and sorry, and before I go back to electrolyzers, the other one that's enabled this is really the PEM fuel cell. So the PEM fuel cell has been, uh, did not go away. It's been getting um, better and better, just like these other technologies, the costs are going down, the power densities are going up, the efficiencies improved. So this again was a bit of a, an attractor barrier problem. You've got a fuel cell, you still need to, to um, fuel it. Well, now we have a bit of a demand driver if we're going to have fuel cell deployment because that does look like an economic pathway. And in many ways, the, the components, the issues to do with fabrication, the modularity that we see in a PEM fuel cell reflects also an electrolyzer. So we were getting some indirect benefits from the PEM developments in terms of electrolyzer development. So, um, you know, I'll, going back to your question, there's, there's a lot of different ways we can get hydrogen from. I think what's changed is the realization that there's a convergence of these techno-economic techno drivers that make electrolysis when you project forward again, when you think about this net zero place in the future is a really, um, it looks like it's going in the right direction. And it's for the same reasons we're seeing renewables and batteries uh, coming on strong. I think I've answered the question. Great, thank you. I think Yulan has a question for you. Go ahead, Yulan. Uh... <laughs> Andrew, I, I have a question which is about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the overall efficiency uh, from hydrogen production to um, power production from fuel cells, for example, you, if we consider renewable and full renewable energy as a source of energy, for example, wind power, and use e naturalizer for producing hydrogen, the hydrogen being compressed or liquefied for storage or compressed to, you know, 700 uh, bars. And then you, you fill the, the hydrogen to, um, to uh, fuel cells for a power production, either for powering a car or a home or uh, whatever. So uh, do you have any idea in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, from, end to end sort of efficiency for, 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 for that. And then and I'll be interested in, in, in knowing that because my own calculation probably is, is not very optimistic. So, so if you could have shared some light on that, it'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the path you just described, which is the electrolysis back to a fuel cell in a vehicle, perhaps, those numbers in terms of efficiency aren't very compelling. And so I don't think you, um, I don't think we should generalize that's going to be the one that rolls out. I think there's certain areas which are um, efficiency is less important, let's say. It's really going to come down to what, what is the overall benefit and value you get. And, um, and it's going to be cost driven, not efficiency driven. So there's just really, really difficult things to solve if you don't have something like a chemical currency, a, a zero carbon chemical currency in, in the mix. And um, so the, the light duty fuel cell vehicle, I tend to agree. If you look at the cost efficiency combination for that particular uh, way to maybe decarbonize transportation, that might not be the most compelling one, unless you're looking again at something that's got real range issues. But batteries are 
looking pretty darn good. So um, yeah, I think it goes back to those really difficult areas. And, um, you know, when we think forward, assuming we're going to get back to flying airplanes, that's always the classic example. What are we going to do for flight? What are we going to do for this long haul shipping? And, and um, I think it'll be a cost driven answer less than, than an efficiency driven answer. Okay, Yulang, you have a, maybe a, a quick another question uh, for Andrew. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's great. Thank you. Um, my f is, is a comment rather, rather than a question is about, you know, the uh, because uh, my calculation is a sort of a fairly optimistic, it's less than 10% of efficiency and with 90% uh, turns into heat. So my rationale for that, it would be sort of a, we should probably look at the multi-energy vector approach. So um, make use of uh, those heat, which is probably over 90%. Uh, for other purposes. So that's my, my, my comments and, and, uh, and a suggestion to, to all to consider. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. Long, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to say hydrogen is it is the only thing. I think it's a, it is a mixture of vectors for sure. Absolutely. Um, but just the last bit I was going to say, I guess, about the efficiency avenue. You know, we can make the argument that, uh, that making electricity using natural gas and, and um, you know, a, a gas turbine, that's not terribly efficient. But we do it because it's it cost it's cost competitive, um, but the efficiency on that's terrible. So you know, I, I, again, I think if we think about it more of a from a systems perspective, um, there's there's places where this will roll out. There's value that comes, and it's again this difference between value and cost. And I think that's a really hard thing to talk about. We like to focus on cost cost of buying one widget but then it's the value that we get and, and that only comes from when you integrate it into the system itself and you look at how it compares to other options so you're bang on i think that's gonna it's gonna be different in different places depending upon the relative you know cost value proposition thank you so uh, basically we have to work on different technologies there is no one solution to to energy uh, problems so we have to work on different technologies and uh, and and work in on those in parallel. So uh, I have a comment I'd like to add. Sure. Just since, uh, it is my opinion that any energy storage technology that has a round trip energy efficiency less than fifty percent is dead in the water. Simply because, in contrast with alternative conventional generating technologies, where the energy is so cheap and easy to dump. Every bit of inefficiency in an energy storage system is something that you have to design in additional infrastructure to account for. And uh, that means additional heat transfer, uh, that waste heat, fans, maintenance, filters, all kinds of things that in my experience in the energy storage sector, being involved with a lot of different projects, those costs all come to bear eventually um, so using a simplistic uh, number of dollars per kilowatt hour or something at the front end often doesn't account for longer term maintenance and operations. And when those efficiencies go down, uh, things get worse. In the battery technologies that we work in, um, we see this as a direct cost because not only does it tend to degrade the energy storage system faster by being hotter if it's less efficient, but I also have to plow more electricity back in just to the cooling system alone to keep it cool. And that has pretty substantial ramifications. And I think societally, we should be aimed at maximizing uh, our utilization of the energy products that we have. That's true. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for that comment, Lucas. You're, you're absolutely right. So, uh, that's uh, let's go on to, to you, Lucas, uh, as far as, uh, you know, I was really uh, interested in your triangle uh, approach to, uh, you know, optimizing the energy storage and uh, whether it comes from solar or wind or uh, any other technology. So um, I know you have you haven't mentioned it in your uh, introduction uh, comments, but I know you have actually worked with refurbishing uh, old car batteries, and especially with the uh, in Ontario and in Canada in general, and in the in other places in in the world as well. Uh, electrical cars are going to be 
in our future. I was even, you know, I might even consider buying one myself, but I have been thinking about like, when I buy an electrical vehicle and it has a lot of batteries in it, where does this um, battery end up eventually? I know you're refurbishing those and, and that's great, but then eventually we have to get rid of these batteries. So uh, what's your uh, thought on that? So we do have a very substantial project uh, that's been ongoing for several years on uh, the, the keywords are actually repurposing electric vehicle batteries into grid storage. The reason behind the repurposing is twofold. Uh, one, speaking to the utilization factor that I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, the more uh, benefit we can get from every battery that's out there, the better. And so if you have the ability to take it out of a vehicular application, like an electric vehicle, whenever that vehicle achieves its end of life um, and repurpose it, you get additional utilization out of that. And that's a good thing. And there's lots of reasons why these batteries uh, that are produced even today will outlast the life of the vehicle. And it's simply that vehicles are a lot like cell phones, certainly passenger vehicles. We don't want them for more than a certain period of time. They get old and they look funny, they rust, and they also get in accidents. Um, and so in all of those cases, the battery will likely outlast the electric vehicle and uh, we'll need to put it into a secondary service. Uh, and the second reason is that, as mentioned, uh, recycling of lithium ion batteries right now is um, fraught with complexity, I guess I will say. There's very limited components inside them that are valuable and that makes it uh, uneconomic to recycle them, quite frankly. There's lots of great uh, new startup companies looking uh, for ways to do this, one of which is in Ontario and is rapidly moving to New York right now um, to do recycling of batteries. Uh, but that uh, is a developing market. And so being able to stave off the recycling for anywhere from between five to 10 to 15 years right now is a good thing because it allows that market to develop. Um, so our work in, in Second Life Batteries, we have batteries out of Teslas, batteries out of Chevrolets, batteries out of Nissans. We run many hundreds of kilowatt hours in our laboratory all the time, cycling them back and forth and looking at the characteristics that each battery has. And I'm absolutely astounded at uh, the number of different systems that have been put in place by different automotive manufacturers. And what I mean by that is some batteries are cooled via air, some batteries are passively cooled, some batteries are liquid cooled. Some batteries use pouch cells, some use cylindrical cells, some use prismatic cells. And then there's the different cathode or positive active materials that are inside those cells, which might be NCA, nickel cobalt aluminum, such as Tesla uses, or NMC, such as Chevrolet uses, nickel manganese cobalt. And um, all this creates a great deal of complexity. And interestingly, in driving the cost out of the electric vehicle, they're trying to remove those high value components, which makes recycling look even less desirable um, going forward. So I'm not a recycling expert at all. I, I don't work in that area, but in the repurposing, there's a lot of good value that can come from these batteries over the uh, longer term in a stationary application that's easier than the original electric vehicle application, no doubt. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll access um, those those things going forward. And I look forward to seeing how uh, the recycling industry advances to uh, be able to utilize uh, and, and uh, break down these batteries, preferably to make it into a closed loop system, which I think is being promoted by a brand new company in Nevada right now, uh, trying to utilize all the way up to 100% of uh, the old batteries and, and drive that back into the use stream of, uh, of new batteries. Great. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Any, anybody else wants to uh, add, uh, any of the panelists want to add to Lucas's comments? I have one question to, to lead into uh, Ian, actually, who I don't think has spoken in quite some time, so I look forward to hearing him. He's next um, on my list. <laughs> great. So, but to lead that way, in our opening up of used electric vehicle batteries and exploring and reverse engineering uh, the pack designs, uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is that uh, early on, they were highly modular and the components were added and stacked and bolted together. And they were very, very easy to take apart. And to drive out costs, they're now being glued together 
which makes them very difficult. We've recently cut open Tesla Model 3 batteries and they're very, very hard to get apart to the point where I think you just chuck them into um, something that would you know, pulverize them into little pieces if you're recycling them. And I think given Mr. Musk's announcement the other day of using the cells inside the battery as a structural element speaks to even further integration and making them difficult to remove for, for recycling. And so this is clearly the direction the industry I think is headed in um, for economic purposes, but it has ramifications. And I was hoping that uh, Ian, you might discuss that. And I'll rely upon you, Lucas, for the details of it. But just uh, hearing you describe it right now, it, it strikes me that uh, it goes against the, the comment of resilience that I made and adaptiveness and flexibility and so on, in the sense that that plus the whole, um, if you're talking about it being um, integrated and not able to take apart and correct me if I'm wrong, repair or reuse particular elements, whatever the case may be, the obsolescence of it and the, the putting it towards some sort of discarding is all the more is all the quicker. So I guess hearing you describe it, um, the couple of things I, I think of are the lack of resilience in the sense of being able to adapt and modify a technology as you move forward because of the way it's still being delivered to you. And the other thing is the, the prospects of reuse sound to me as you describe it much lower. Do I have either of those right? Yes. Interesting, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess another thing that just uh, raises the issue of the ways in which um, uh, private sector, large private sector companies operate and, and work. I know, Lucas, I, I believe you work with many different manufacturers and many different players and the ways in which they work to potentially, I'd love to hear your reactions on this, um, make you wedded to their particular ecosystem and not allow you to transverse across. That's true. Uh, I, th I think, although it seems to me that it's the direction that the engineering team on each manufacturer wishes to head. Uh, they're so different and yet they achieve the same thing, meaning a vehicle that drives around with batteries in it. Um, I've been absolutely astounded at how such differing designs can achieve such similar results. But uh, in, perhaps you could transition into speaking about the energy storage industry perhaps as a whole in longer term life cycle analysis um, and, and how uh, that's being considered at the front end of design and maybe that's what the automotive sector needs to learn from. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not privy to the details of that and I'll leave it to other experts on it, um, I mean, I, I would argue it's important to have resilience in your design from the outset. And what I've heard uh, from the sessions today, which have been fascinating, was the ways in which the multiple value propositions of energy storage, there has to be a nimbleness to be able to react to particular conditions. And so that regulatory settings and so on are able to activate or catalyze those different services that energy storage provide as well. So it strikes me, I think I said the words, um, expect the unexpected to be able to go into uh, a, a setting saying that you've got a, a toolkit to achieve the goals you want uh, without necessarily knowing that on, on day 87 at hour 14, this particular service will be provided to be able to have that resilience and flexibility going forward. All right, so I want to go uh, next to, uh, to Ian. Uh, uh, so it, it looks like we're just traveling really nicely from one panelist to another. So uh, you, in your introductory comments, you talked about uh, expect the unexpected and we are actually living through that right now with the, with the COVID-19, unfortunately. And then um, uh, also I wanted to touch base with your um, with our previous discussions on not leaving anybody be behind. So, uh, and we have seen that with COVID, we have seen that with, uh, uh, you know, healthcare, other issues, you know, we don't want to leave anybody behind. How can we actually implement these uh, new energy storage technologies and not leave anybody behind and also make sure that these technologies are socially 
socially acceptable? Yeah, no, great question, and then uh, thoughts that, that come to my mind and that, again, picking up themes that I heard uh, this morning and early this afternoon made me think of, I, I've been hearing, as perhaps many of us have, the so-called four Ds of the energy transition. And the one I'll focus on, a little, or the one that got me thinking was digitalization, sitting alongside decarbonization, decentralization, and demand centricity. Um, and, and as I, I'm hearing about digitalization and so on, and reflecting upon what we're all experiencing the past seven months, what we're experiencing right now is the advanced use of information and communication technology. Um, and I also recognize we're a panel of university professors. So the five of us and perhaps others in the audience as well have had to be dealing with this, uh, make use of these advanced technologies in order to do our jobs over the past seven months. And I think um, all of us have been very, very successful and we've come to see the value of it as we've kept connected with our students during these troubled times. So the paradoxical element is though we're talking about physical distancing and we should rightly be so, and so we're isolated in our, in our basements or whatever the case may be, we, we've got these connections. But through these activities, we've also seen that there, there is still a digital divide out there. And I know that um, virtually every professor has had to navigate how do we ensure our students are able to connect with the proper hardware, software, access to data, whatever the case may be. In, in a country like Canada, it may be less frequent, but it certainly exists, but globally, in many parts of the world, it's, a, it's a, a reality. This digital divide is there. And so uh, as we think about the future energy system, I think we've got to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind and as digitalization and those other elements move forward, that we ensure that the mechanisms to keep everyone moving forward together are there. That might be financial, that might be regulatory, that might be strategy reflecting upon how different kinds of policies cross fertilize as well. I, I was thinking we've done some work on the smart grid elements and, and Matthew Sachs in an earlier uh, panel was talking about the uh, utility death spiral and he, he laid out very, very nicely, not saying it's a certainty or anything, but that possibility as more wealthy customers are able to defect from the conventional grid because they purchase high value, high cost equipment to perhaps generate on their own, store on their own, so on and so forth, meet their own needs. The service of the grid, the collective good falls upon a smaller number of people and on average a poorer number of people. So how do we ensure that, that uh, parts of our community aren't left behind as we wanna make sure that outstanding energy services are provided to all. So Handon, that's just a couple of reactions on that. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ian. There is a uh, there is a question from Antonio Carlos, uh, which is you know we are not in the question and answer period, but this is you know way uh, at your alley. What you know continuation of our discussion. He's uh, asking about how can these particular new technologies help promoting social inclusion, as you mentioned in your introduction. So. Um, yeah. So uh, great question. And as you, as you talk about the technologies, I think of the range of technologies across the, the um, energy life cycle. And I also think about those technologies that can serve to uh, support a sustainable energy system as well. So I'm thinking about communication devices. I'm thinking about means of engaging communities in participatory stakeholdering, for example. So I, I think across all those areas, solar panels, energy storage, um, software or knowledge systems in order to uh, promote uh, interchange of energy, um, as well as things like engaging people in energy discussions and stakeholdering as well, have the potential to be very inclusive, but it won't necessarily occur. So it has to be something that is designed in and anticipated as well as possible. And, and this isn't always in terms of high tech, it can be in the more simple elements. 
case studies that some of our students have looked at have just sort of have, have included things like ensuring there's access to community meetings, ensuring that uh, they are in times of the day and in locations that are accessible to as many people as possible and the means of participation are, are easy and easily visible as well. Thanks, Andrew. Great. Uh, and there is also some work I know of uh, that's going on with the uh, indigenous communities in the northern and uh, uh, as well as uh, other places as well. So I think those discussions should, should continue and then we should basically include everybody. Exactly. So uh, with that, uh, my, uh, if, are there any other questions from the, from the audience? Please uh, type the questions in the qu question and answer in the Q&A that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, until we have those typed up, I have um, some, some other questions for the, for the panelists um, uh, before, we, uh, before we complete this session. Uh, the commercialization of these technologies. So we're all working on different technologies of whether it's thermal, um, electrical storage, and so on. How do you see the commercialization of these technologies? I think uh, I'm going to start with uh, Yulang. It looks like you have actually have some experience in this area, commercializing some of your technologies. Can you speak to that a little bit? And then we'll go to other panelists. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the uh, um, I'm a technologist or, or sort of a half scientist or high, half sort of an engineer. Um, my my sort of a experience with with commercializing really you have to work with the right partner, which is industrial partner, because we are good at as an academic, we are good at technology development. We uh, we know a little bit about the leads, which is a from the macroscopic level. Uh, you know what's the world need and what's the sort of a, community would need, but actually commercially, we probably not really sure in, in many cases. So the best way is to work with, with, with industrialists who actually know, uh, you know, the actual gap and where the, you know, the value and the, uh, um, the commercial proposition and so on and so forth. So, so, so the, the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the two uh, technologies which have been commercialized are the liquid air storage, which is actually right from beginning. I was working with a company called Highview, and they, 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 they funded the part of the, the, the research I did, and, and of course they own the IPs, and uh, so they are the company probably would worth probably somewhere between three hundred million and five hundred million at the moment. Regrettably, there's no, I, I, I don't share that because uh, I was uh, working for the university. So anyway, so that's one thing. And, and I think if you really want down that properly, I think probably you have to consider, A, how would you work, work with the company? And, and uh, B, um, because uh, in early stages, uh, it's very difficult. You don't know if that would be successful. And uh, uh, I myself uh, uh, founded about three companies, actually only one was successful, which is a uh, is what I'm going to talk about. The second technology is about uh, some energy storage technology, which is actually is a part of a joint research between uh, UK and another country. And uh, um, you know, both sides funded the research and actually, uh, and with involvement probably about 20 industrial companies. And actually one of the companies, which was very small at that time, and they pick up one of the aspects that then they commercialize technology. So, um, so Again, um, the commercializing side need to be done by company, not by ourselves. Uh, we, well, from my perspective, and, and because I'm not good at sort of, a, uh, you know, going out to talk to companies and, and uh, uh, um, take all the stresses. Uh, and uh, so because uh, investors, they're, they're not as gentle as, as us as academics. So, so we have to <laughs> really, sort of, uh, really a balance between academic life and a sort of a commercialization. So, so um, the third example is something in between, which is a, has been um, on commercial trial, which is a cold, cold storage for uh, cold chain technologies, mainly for sort of a, uh, road and rail transportation uh, for um, you know the uh, um, uh, fresh produce, uh, flowers, meat, uh, uh, you know ice cream, and so on and so forth. So so yeah, the technology I developed led to about seventy patents, which is a 
already been com uh, the on commercial trial for uh, road in Asian countries, which is about uh, nearly 50,000 kilometers, I think, uh, as of today, probably. And also there are 50 um, uh, vehicles on road on commercial trial. I think that's already been um, done last year. This year, I think because COVID, that's been delayed. So uh, even though, They've been successful, and we have uh, uh, validated or uh, proved that uh, the operational cost can be eighty percent, eighty-five percent lower compared with diesel-powered vehicles. But you know, the uh, we're still uh, well, not me. I mean, still still struggling in uh, set up a company to actually uh, doing that. So so I. I, I dedicated company to do that. So, so that, that's a sort of a current uh, situation. So it's not easy. It, 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 it takes a long time. Is any technology say, you know, um, we can do that within two or three years, three or five years, probably is a lie. So anyway, so, so, so that means from me, thank you. Wishful thinking at least. Anybody <laughs> <laughs> else wants to uh, jump on that, uh, on the commercialization? I'll, I'll jump in, even though it's really thin ice because I have no, <laughs> no credibility in the space. But um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little observation, I guess, is I, I sort of had one of these days where I realized that, um, you know, what we should be saying is we're not, uh, you're not commercializing a technology. You need to commercialize a product. And the example I'll say is, is Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk did not invent an electric car. He did not invent lithium ion batteries. What he did is created a high quality product that people want to buy. And, um, you know, I look back at all the other, I mean, I got a dollar for a patent at one point, but I think about the many failed enterprises that are, are sort of technology driven. And I think we got to get people to spin their head around to think about creating things that people want and maybe industry wants, depending where it is in the, in the chain. But particularly for end use devices, people don't, I think a lot of people don't want to think about energy. They just want to have a high quality product that they know is probably going to work well and is also good for the environment. I know I'm that way. I like when I switch on the lights at home, I'm happy it's it's hydro and it's pretty, pretty clean. But honestly, I don't want to go home after work and think about <laughs> all these nuances and, you know, the implications. I, I just want to know that there that is there and it's embedded. So I'm really, a, you know, I think a lot of people really just want to have a, a, a good quality product that's good for the environment and hopefully fit some other cultural expectations and economic ones. So I think the word product instead of technology is actually a way to, to spin that. But I, again, totally outside my area of expertise. I'll leave it there. All right, so I know we're running a bit uh, short of time. We have to finish in a few minutes, but there is uh, uh, actually a couple of questions for uh, Lucas, actually. So I'm just uh, from Eldridge Robello. It's saying that uh, you work with batteries from different manufacturers without naming anyone. Would you be able to comment on the tendency of manufacturers to hide data or prevent customers from accessing data beyond the most basic. Is this becoming more or less common, particularly with uh, stationary batteries? Oh, absolutely. It's becoming more common. Uh, I am uh, a mechanical engineer. And when I was young, uh, the concept of changing the oil in the car was uh, something we just all naturally did. And then automotive manufacturers started putting more and more plastic on top of engines and, and hiding them from us to make them look prettier, which was attractive at point of sale, but meant that people didn't no, or people no longer felt that they were uh, capable of doing such things. The energy storage industry is no different. Uh, initially, much data is provided because the people who are engaged in that are interested and want to learn about it and so on. But as it becomes a uh, highly developed product intended for general populations use, all of the uh, technical data gets hidden behind things. Now it's remarkable how many technologists are out there that are able to crack the code, if you will. And so we buy all kinds of equipment in our laboratory that allows us to interrogate battery management systems that are commercial grade and uh, are hidden, if you will. And we get inside them and look around and see stuff, but it requires a lot of effort to do. 
um, the findings are always very significant and has shaped much of my research to have that kind of information. And I uh, appreciate um, companies and groups that give away more of that information. The problem I think principally comes with the public is interested. And when you start to give information, then you have to give training on how that information should be interpreted and used. And that leads you down a, a pathway of consumer education, which can be very expensive and, and frankly can lead to lots of warranty claims that are unintentional, uh, really, and perhaps don't deserve, uh, deserve um, anyone giving them the time of day. But of course, the customer's always right. And so we try to give them the time of day. And it can be really difficult. So I'm, I'm not surprised, but unfortunately, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a question on uh, uh, for you, Lucas, again on uh, from from Yulan. Uh, he is asking about the thermal management of your uh, electrical vehicle, of pure electrical vehicles. The future for thermal energy management of uh, pure EVs. Hmm. Well, the thermal energy management system. When I started working in EVs 15 plus years ago, was all about uh, dealing with the peak loads the big drivetrain loads and how much power you were pulling in the vehicle, say you were towing something or going uphill for long distance. That's no longer the case. Uh, now the thermal system is designed to withstand the very, very high rate charging activities that we all expect so that we can fast charge our electric vehicles. On the one hand, this is good because it's a constant rate fast charge, at least for a while, and then, and then that rate decays. So we've learned how to handle that. I think you're going to see a continued evolution of the liquid cooling systems that go on. I think you're going to see a reduction in thermal path lengths um, to try to keep the temperature very consistent throughout the cells and throughout the battery pack. Uh, and that consistency is what leads to long life. When you have a quality manufactured product, if you keep it more consistent, uh, that will lead to longer life with less failures. Great, uh, thank you very much. And before, uh, before I, I don't think I don't see any other questions uh, from every anybody. But my last question is, I would like to uh, kind of uh, ask panelists about the cost of the energy storage because that's the bottom line. If, if it's not uh, economically viable, none of the technologies will work. So anybody wants to uh, have a crack at it? Um, I, I could start, and uh, so uh, my view is that uh, you know uh, has to be cost effective, and otherwise, uh, no one would. Uh, well, it's, it, it, otherwise it would, it would be difficult to survive. So that's my view. <laughs> right. Anybody else wants to say a few words? I'll pitch in. Oh, yeah, I'll pitch in. Handed. Um, just a quick one. Uh, often people, often it is rightly talked about the costs of strategies for an energy transition, but we also have to remember the costs of not pursuing an energy transition. The, the status quo has significant costs. Uh, the costs of cl climate change, we will have to adapt to a climatically changed environment anyway, and the costs of doing that to extreme weather events and so on uh, means that the status quo isn't an option. And just to, just to make one more point, because I think that's really important, the existing technologies were built under a different level of bureaucracy and regulation, which made them more competitive. Uh, try installing a solar photovoltaic system on a house today, and you'll be shocked at how many warning labels it comes with, just because it's a new technology, and now we have warning labels, whereas 20 years ago, we didn't. And uh, those are all costs being borne by the new technology. And, and so no wonder that we incentivize it to some extent to compete against the incumbents. I think it's really important to recognize that, Ian. Thank you. Right. Uh, Andrew, do you have anything to add as a last word? No, I don't think so. I think cost is important, but cost is also relative. Ultimately, every technology we talk about typically has a competitor. And those competitors don't sit idle. So if they can meet the goals we set for them, you know, technologies will adapt and companies will figure out better ways to to get what you want if if there's a motivation. So mm -hmm. yeah, cost is important, but it's it's all relative. That's true. 
Okay, with that, uh, so I think uh, that concludes this session. So I'm going to, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists being on time. Thank you very much. It's been a very successful uh, event overall, like my, not only for this session, but the whole day, I really enjoyed uh, all the discussion. So I'm going to uh, turn the microphone or the screen to, to Bala to wrap things up. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and um, thank you, Handen, and thank you, panelists. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on the panel and uh, for the very informative discussion. Really appreciate it, and good to see all of you after a long time. Um, uh, there are a lot of people applauding. Unfortunately, you cannot hear them because of the virtual nature of this uh, conference. Uh, while while uh, closing it down, I know we're a few minutes behind. Just want to point out that my two friends, Edison and Graham Bell, uh, they started on a different path. Edison decided to make the electricity system and Bell made the communication system. In about 100 years or there, uh, if Bell comes today, he'll see, man, this, this system has changed so much. We went from wired phones to cellular phones, satellite phones, and so on. Edison would be uh, you know, totally awestruck. Oh, you managed to keep whatever I created back then 100 years ago. The system hasn't changed in 100 years. Um, that's true. And also, I think the change in energy system is, is uh, required. It is important just because of the nature of greenhouse gases we are creating. The other side of the story is about being equitable. Um, you know, when the maker decided to create Canada, he gave an easy pass to those in Victoria. And Andrew is smiling there. So uh, while we let you go off there, Andrew, but I think uh, in the future, when we make this energy transition happen, it has to be equitable. And we have to make sure everybody is taken aboard along with us in that journey. So those are my just a uh, few uh, jovial comments, if that's okay. Um, and then thank you very much. Hopefully this conference has uh, shown a true value for collaboration between the academia, industry, government, and utilities working together to address Canada and the world's biggest challenges around energy, particularly energy storage and building a clean energy future for all of us. And I strongly believe we are all a part of the solution. So uh, on behalf of the Center for Urban Energy at Ryerson and also uh, NSERC Energy Storage Technology Network, I'd like to thank everyone who has participated. Thank you so much. We look forward to hosting you for the next um, event hopefully in person, otherwise in online. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.